Welcome to the Concordia Publishing House podcast, where we consider everything in the light of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm your host, Elizabeth Pittman. On today's episode of the CPH podcast, we're joined by Eden Keefe. Eden is the president of Lutheran Women in Mission, or LWML. She's going to share with us what it looks like to be a woman on mission for Christ. Before we start our conversation with Eden, I'd like to thank our friends at the LCMS Foundation for their support of the podcast. How can your congregation turn significant financial gifts into a long-term funding source that blesses your church for generations to come? The LCMS Foundation was created to do just that. They've provided professional investment services to LCMS churches, schools, and RSOs. They've helped these congregations create, manage, and grow endowments using investments tailored to each congregation's unique goals and needs. And now they'd like to help yours. Visit lcmsfoundation.org slash podcast to learn more. Now into our conversation with Eden Keefe. Welcome, Eden, to the CPH podcast. Thank you. It is really nice to have you here. It's been a big few months for you, hasn't it? Yes, it has. It's been a bit of a whirlwind since the end of June. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had a chance to breathe and to just sit back and take it all in? Uh, not unless it was like in the car or something. I haven't really had too much time, but you know, I still take time with family and and to do things and church and and that kind of thing. But yeah, it hasn't so, all always really sunk in yet. Being elected. <laughs> well, as the new president of Lutheran Women and Mission (LWML). Um, it has been a big few months from you. Every every four years, the president changes. Yeah. We've, we've spoken in the past with President Debbie and um, enjoyed chatting with her. And we're looking forward to watching LWML under your leadership these next four years. My guess, how long have you been involved with LWML? Oh, golly. Well, it started when I was young because my mom and grandmas were involved with Ladies mm -hmm. Aid and LWML. And um, my sister and I kind of got voluntold to help with different <laughs> things along the way. But it, honestly, it wasn't until um, after I was married and had moved up to the Kansas City area that a friend from home actually had moved up also. And we decided to uh, join a circle at her church together. And that's when it really became my LWML. And um, I got involved in lots of different ways. You know, one thing just kind of leads to the next and it's a beautiful ripple effect. And uh, that was probably in the late eighties, mid to late eighties. Okay. So do you have a favorite memory from those early days? I'm sure there are gonna be a lot of highlights for you over the years, but as you think back to your early days in your LWML, are there some, is there a memory that sticks out for you? Gosh, I think honestly, when we were also part of a mission church here in Olathe, Kansas, and when it became, um, when we decided to have our own group and got started to get involved and the national convention was here in 95, I think it was. And we had like 12 to 14 women who showed an interest just in volunteering and helping at that at that convention and we got to see the big picture from a volunteer standpoint anyway and that kind of launched uh, it for us at beautiful savior then too so that was probably a highlight i could it sounds like it would be a, a neat highlight to see that coming together and then in recent memory i would think that your election will definitely go down in the history <laughs> books as a highlight how did that how did that feel i know it's i've got a few questions related to all of that but it's, it's always neat from sitting where I sit to see a friend and see someone who I admire like stepping into that role. I think it's going to be exciting. But how did you feel? Were you just completely floored? Uh, it doesn't it doesn't quite seem real. And uh, mm -hmm. you may be aware that really the six months prior to convention, uh, Shark Kramer and I did a lot of collaborating and visiting sometimes on a weekly basis where we would just, you know, pray together and work together on some of the pre-convention preparations we had to do. And that added a whole nother level of peace in all honesty and joy. And it, it was just, 
it was just a moment where it didn't matter <laughs> who won. It really didn't matter. We were just waiting for God to kind of guide next steps for us individually and for Lutheran Women in Mission and to be able to be sitting next to each other uh, during that was a blessing. And having my family, having quite a few members of my family there was a blessing. So, highlight. Well, that. that was going to be my question because I had heard that you and Char did yeah. spend that time together. And I thought that was such a beautiful example of, you know, two, two leaders who are being put up for the same role, like working together for the good of the organization in just such a beautiful way. I think it's just, it's an example that a lot of organizations could learn from. The collaboration, you know, being mm -hmm. able, and you weren't by, I wasn't by myself. She wasn't by herself right. in kind of going through all the emotions. And there are a lot of emotions <laughs> that go on, like on a daily basis, uh, but you don't have to go through it alone. and. I think it solidified for me personally how important that collaboration is then going forward. Uh, don't lose that because we saw what a blessing it was. Don't lose that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a great lesson. What is something many of us have grown up hearing about Lutheran Women in Mission and <laughs> LWML and I can remember our ladies aid and you didn't mess with the kitchen that the ladies aid were <laughs> in control of. Um, what's something that many people may not know about the LWML that could surprise them. Well, maybe if, if you're talking about some, uh, maybe a casual observer, um, they may not be aware of the reach, I would say, of LWML. And that's one thing when you go to a district convention or a national convention and you see that parade of flags where the nations that have been touched with mission grants uh, in the past, you don't understand the scope of gospel work, I think, that happens through just those, you know, might, what we call might box offerings or might donations. Uh, they are indeed mighty mites, and together God can use us for great things. So I think people would be maybe surprised at the scope of work that LWML does, the, the reach um, that we have for the gospel, and maybe just how you, we can use our gifts um, through the organization. Now, the, the mites are mighty, yeah. and it's just, and at convention, a new slate of mission grants were approved. Are there any highlights from that list that I know they're, they're all special and they're all doing wonderful things? Are there one or two that you'd like to highlight for our listeners? Oh, you know, I think we all have our favorites. And I've, I've always thought when I, I didn't have a vote this year, <laughs> but when I've been a voting <laughs> member, it's been always so hard to just like pick eight. That's normally kind of that around that figure that we can vote for. And it's so hard to narrow it to something like that. I mean, there's usually a few favorites, yes, but then you just look at that all those opportunities. And um, I love the variety actually is probably was a highlight that that we have stateside, I think 13, um, that there were four for Lutheran schools in the US, um, that there were eight, I think abroad, and then some that, that work both domestically and globally. Um, there are LCMS ministries, there's Concordia Seminary, those we just, um, touch in so many different places. No, and it's, it's, it's exciting to see how that happens and the, the reach. And I know you have resources on your website where people can learn more about each of the grants. So I'd encourage our listeners to take a look at that and see how you might be interested and able to support. Um, so at coming out of convention, which is always a mountaintop experience, it's it's wonderful for us on the CPH team to be there and to talk with all the women attending. And just, it is so joy filled and the enthusiasm for, you know, sharing the gospel and learning more about our faith is, is palpable and it's exciting. What, coming out of that, what excites you about the next biennium? Keeping that momentum going. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. 
as we start this next biennium in August, we met and prayerfully worked through the list of, of women who um, filled out a, a form that they were interested in serving on a national committee and, and filled our committees, made our calls, got, got our answers, and we'll be coming in October to train and let them plan in their committees their work for the biennium. And it's it's wonderful. I think this year you're going to see some shift in some of our committees where they're, we're working on how to better network, um, not just a top-down communication, but how do we get ideas coming from the local groups and congregations up to national through the district? Mm -hmm. Because in 2022, we celebrated 80 years and as part of that, we kind of did what's your 80, you know, a way to sort of observe that in our districts. And they had, there were amazing um, ideas and service projects and um, gosh, things that people did individually to observe that. And we thought we need to continue to utilize all that creativity that we see on the local mm -hmm. level and and network that across the districts and then you know up to national back down so we're, we're really working on how can we better support districts in in their communication so kind of through technology support but also how do we continue to just kind of that relationship and that connection with people down in the districts and the local levels because there's a lot of wonderful creative women out there that are working for the lord well, continuing that idea of, of things that are happening at the local level, how can our listeners get involved locally? Um, and then part two of that is if they don't have an active chapter in at their church or in their area, how, how what are some options for them to get involved? Nice mug. <laughs> um, those are great questions. Uh, the first one, how do you get involved locally? If, if you're if your church congregation has a Lutheran Women in Mission LWML group, normally there are times that they meet. It might be that they sponsor Bible study, women's Bible study. It might be that they meet for kind of like business meetings to plan events at church. Um, it might be that they meet to coordinate mission projects uh, locally, you know, um, and then Besides the local level, then there's also what we call the zone, and that's where congregations that are sort of in, in, in an area or region would get together. Maybe that's a couple times a year. Um, maybe your district has a retreat. So there are lots of different ways to get involved, whether it's just something you want to do an event um, or, or help with a, a donation for something uh, locally at your congregation, whether you want to kind of get involved in planning some things at on your congregation and your congregation for um, LWML events. Um, or if you don't have an active group there, there are other things that happen in your region and in within your district that you can get involved with. Um, I've had both experiences. I've had, I've been in congregations that have active LWML groups. And then when I lived in South Carolina, uh, when we first moved there, we were blessed with an LCMS church in Aiken, South Carolina. Uh, did not have, though, a quote-unquote LWML group. Had a very mission-minded group, and um, I just was able to bring kind of visibility. I, I, you know, could share the quarterly and talk about LWML, and we had the mic box, and we just talked about what, you know, the mission grants were and brought that to them. And and so there was involvement there. And then, you know, I'm, I'm going to the retreat. Anybody want to go with me um, in that way? So there are ways to be involved. I was at that time an individual member in the district. And that allowed me to serve um, on a district level as well, which was a really great way to get to know the women uh, of the district. In that case, it was the Carolinas. And there are a lot of ways. And so if someone is in a scenario, as you were in South Carolina, where there's not that chapter, I would say probably start with your website. And I think if you click around and find your district and connect there. And yeah. 
That's um, a that's a great trip. one um, to just you know the about us because yes, mm -hmm. all the district websites are listed there, and then usually district websites have ways to make connects um, as far as that goes. And it might be that you just kind of want to be a networker for your mm -hmm. and in your congregation too, and getting the word out. Lots of lots of neat. I I've known groups that are. Um, I'll call them non-traditional in that they're online. They meet mm -hmm. online or they um, form a group from a number of different congregations. A couple examples, my daughter did that here in the Kansas City area because they were really looking for a group of young women. They wanted to kind of expand LWML, but do it in a way that was more in their age range, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. And so they pulled from a few, they put out invitations to area congregations and said, would you like to get together? And that was specifically initially kind of for fellowship and Bible study. They tended to do kind of the mission work part of it and supporting the mission grants in their own congregations, but they got together for the fellowship and Bible study. I've also known another um, few congregations in rural Kansas who on their own don't have a lot of numbers, but they are getting together and they just within a, a you know, a relatively small um, geographic area, but they get together and, and meet together, even though they're not all from one congregation. So there are ways. <laughs> there are There's ways. Creative, flexible ways. Well, and technology certainly helps with that. We're coming up on the point about the time that this episode is released will be right around the time of LWML Sunday. Tell us about this year's theme. And some of our listeners may not realize you don't have to celebrate LWML Sunday on yep. October 6th. You can do it anytime. But tell us a little bit about this year's theme and, and how LWML Sunday can help um, keep that momentum going in the local congregation. And, and you're right. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> LWML Sunday can be done any time in the year. We tend to focus on October, and that's when the resources and stuff uh, come out in preparation for that. This year's theme is The King is Coming. And Dr. Roosevelt Gray is the one who wrote the sermon for this year's theme. It's based on Psalm 24. And I think it's so timely because he sets it within that psalm of, you know, even when things around us are difficult, um, we have the king and he is coming. We have his promises and we can rejoice in that. So I think it will be a joyful uh, time. The resources are really tailored so you can use it however your pastor and your congregation would like to do. So you, there's everything from bulletin, pre-printed bulletin covers to things you can download and print, litanies, uh, the sermon. Um, you can certainly get LWML uh, mission grant bookmarks that, that show the new national, the 31 new national mission grants on it. Uh, those mite boxes, which is, you know, started in the 40s as just a way to put the, the coins in um, to start to support mission grants. And while our methods maybe of donating have changed over the years. Um, that symbol of that mite box remains very much a part of LWML because it just shows what, what impact an individual can have for the gospel when we join together for a common goal. And so um, LWML Sunday could just be the whole package it could be you just have ask your gals to maybe to wear purple, which is one of our big colors, signature colors, and be additional greeters and hand out resources or um, have a display or you just choose. It's a, it's a way to be a little bit more visible in the congregation. It gives us a good excuse. Absolutely. It's a good time to celebrate. Yeah. One of the things that I've... I've admire about you. You're very good at sharing encouragement and the word through through your social media. 
Um, tell us about your your personal devotion time and how you you're able to find that time to keep keep your eyes on the right on the main thing throughout your day and how, how what does that look like? Back when I I'm gonna I'm a storyteller as you've probably noticed so I'm gonna go back just a little bit and tell you when I served as the vice president of Christian Life under um, then President Kay Cricklow and this she. Um, our board, at that time we called the executive committee, were challenged to really continue to keep that morning devotion, that time in, in scripture, or whatever we were doing for our personal spiritual faith uh, first. Make it a priority. Don't let it get lost. And I had to physically, <laughs> and when I did have a laptop, close my laptop at night and put my devotion book on top of it so that I would remember that it goes first. And so that sometimes has been very helpful, just that visual reminder, because I am a visual person, and then I'm gonna go into that. I I do use my portals of prayer. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> and back in about 2015, we were living in Aiken, um, the, the portals of prayer was really by the coffee maker because my husband worked and he left early in the morning, like 530 out the door. So it was there by the coffee maker. And when he brewed the coffee, he would, you know, read through the devotion and leave it there for when I would straggle in later, much later, <laughs> uh, to do, to do the morning thing. But I realized it was becoming kind of rote for me, um, I would faithfully read through it. I could think about it, you know, close with prayer, walk out the room to go, you know, let the dog out or something, come back in. And I could not have told you uh, what it was about. And I thought there's gotta be a way, how do, I, how do I make it so that I not only read and reflect on it, but I make it applicable to me personally today. And at that time, I also happened to meet Connie Denninger. Uh, she was, her husband was the president of the Southeast District. And she introduced me to some visual faith resources and tools. And so I started with a blank calendar template. And my challenge for myself was to, after reading through the devotion and the prayer, that I would just jot down a takeaway. What, what was God, how was he speaking to me through the words and through the devotion narrative? Um, what was my, my takeaway for that day? And to record it on that square, that day square on the calendar. And uh, sometimes a word picture or an image would come to mind and I'd try to sketch that out. So a lot of times it was just a word or three words or something like that. But the wonderful thing for me that happened is when I had that pen in my hand and I actually put it to paper, then I could remember throughout the day whether I was looking at it or not. And then the next day when I came and did it, I had yesterday's right there in front of me. And as you go through the month, you look and you see God's faithfulness all the way through the month. And, and you have that captured in your handwriting on the paper. And sometimes it's out for other family members to see too, which is kind of nice when my grandsons come over that they can see I'm engaged in God's mm -hmm. word. Yeah. So that's my, that is something I have faithfully stuck with since 2015. And um, sometimes I've used color with it right now. It is black and white. It looks like this. <laughs> there you go. And uh, on the following pages, there's a, a blessing page for every day and a prayer list page. So that just keeps it all together for me. I like, now, I like a lot that, of other things pen, too, but. <laughs> well, that putting pen to paper definitely helps. I try to tell my, my youngest this when he's working on his memory work, go write it down. Well, that won't help. Like actually it will. Yeah. 
you may not think so now, but it will actually help. And so that's that's a neat way to help get it imprinted um, in your heart and your mind. So it, it's, as you share this, it, and it's neat how you share it to encourage others, what's, what's some of the encouragement that you've received in your years as you've been serving LWML? You know, there, when I talked at the beginning about kind of that ripple effect as you get involved in one way and then maybe you, you attend something on in your region, your zone, or you go to your district retreat, or you go to a national convention and, and that circle keeps widening, you reconnect with people, you build friendships. And I have found that women are very willing to mentor and encourage you in the faith. The, I think on a local level, having a women's Bible study group where I've been has been tremendously supportive for me um, in my faith journey. And then, you know, I'm amazed at how many now I've been able to um, interact with on social media through Facebook and Instagram that I have not come across necessarily in a personal um, way at an event, but we have found likeness and relationship and um, there's been a lot, something will come in the mail, you know, from somebody that, that I maybe haven't met yet. And those are all, I think women do a really good job of nurturing relationships and uh, they've been real blessings. But I will also say that there are pastors out there that have that gift as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And we all need that support and that encouragement. So it's, it's a good, good practice to be in. Yeah. What would you tell young girls today about what it means uh, to, to be a, a woman in mission at whatever age and stage you are in your life? That there's a joy in it. I, when, when you serve, but in a way that puts Christ as a focus, not just serving people, but serving them with the gospel, that makes a difference not just now, but for potentially for eternity, because he can use us in that way. Um, when you can serve alongside with somebody, collaborate, um, have fun with, you know, whether it's you go with somebody in the car and you just have that com those conversations in the car, or you go and you work an event together, Again, that relationship, it's not just the relationship with you and, and Christ, but it's your relationship with one another. And I think as Lutheran women in mission, we do that well and we find a joy in doing it. So I have, I have rarely, I can't, I know there are times that we've gone and tried something and it might've been frustrating because logistically there were issues, right? but you still had laughter and we worked together to problem solve and we maybe had to go and pull in some other people to help or whatever, but it was still a joyful time of service. And I would say, don't let whatever preconceived notions you might have um, about LWML stop you from at least experiencing it or finding a way to serve um, because I think it will be a joy. Absolutely. So as we start to wrap up, uh, what is a way, how can our listeners pray for you and for Lutheran Women in Mission? Well, that's a very thoughtful question. Thank you. I'm going to answer that two ways. I will um, talk about kind of a personal, I think though, for me as president and the organization that a prayer that we would always remain focused on Christ and on our mission statement. Because I mentioned we've recognized that we've had 80 years of legacy work, uh, supporting missions and our mission partners, um, our church workers as we've gone along, serving uh, through mission service projects, kind of hands-on kinds of things, and being gospel focused whether that's Bible study or um, through, you know, the mission work. As we look to the next 80 years, I want us to find creative and flexible ways for women to be 
Lutheran women in mission and to engage the women of the LCMS to be Lutheran women in mission. So that could be part of the prayer, but that we do it in a way that as Lutheran women in mission, we joyfully proclaim Christ, support missions and equip women to honor God by serving others. I think we just stay true to that and keep our focus on Christ. So that would be my prayer for the organization. Personally, um, very aware of the gift of health, whether that's mental, emotional, spiritual, physical. And so for, that'd probably be my prayer request would be that I um, remain, you know, with the gift of, with the gift of health in all those ways. Well, listeners there, you've heard it direct from <laughs> President Eden, and I would encourage you to keep LWML in your prayers as they continue their good work of supporting missions and helping spread the good news throughout the world um, through through their daily efforts and through their mission grants and everything that they do. We'll link to your website in the show notes so that listeners can go and dig in and learn more, learn more about the mission grants, learn more about LWML Sunday and all that, and I encourage you to check it out. President Eden, thank you so much for being with us today. We look forward to the next four years under your leadership of Lutheran Women in Mission. Well, I look forward to collaborating with you and and CPH because you know I love, love, love using your Bible studies as well in our groups and uh, the the authors and and the relationship that we have um, with them and with you. It's just amazing. So thank you very much. Well, and thank you for being a champion for our <laughs> authors and for our studies. It's great to see. It's great to see how you're able to gin up enthusiasm for for those studies and help spread the word. So we appreciate it very much, President Eden. Thank you so much, and listeners. Till next time. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Concordia Publishing House podcast. I pray that this time was valuable to your walk with Christ. We'd love to connect with listeners on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Concordia Pub. Visit cph.org for more resources to grow deeper in the gospel.